Hello, everyone. We're here from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, where climate change and the climate emergency is front and center. We're at the Methane Pavilion, which is a place where we are discussing one of the most important pollutants that we have to address in order to stop climate change. The science is telling us that we don't have much time. We have about eight years left before we fall off the climate edge. Uh, that means that we need to act fast. We've known this for some time, but I think the world is just starting to realize that we really are in an emergency. Methane is one of the most effective strategies. Methane reduction is one of the, the most effective strategies to reduce climate change, to stop global warming. The scientists have told us if we pass 1.5 degrees of warming, it will be too late. Right. Things will just get too awful. And so methane is a pathway to get there in the short term. And that's why it's so important. And this COP specifically has crafted the methane pledge that's already been signed by over 100 countries to reduce 30% of methane emissions by 2030. That's our pathway to get to stop global warming before it's too late. Today we're going to talk about a very specific issue, which is environmental justice. This idea that certain communities are affected more by environmental contamination than others. This is something that's been uh, worked on for many years. We have three activists that are leaders in this sector that are working in each of their countries. We have Gustavo from Mexico, from the Mexican Center for Environmental Law. Uh, we have our friend John from Texas. He's from the Port Arthur uh, Committee uh, Action Network. Community, Community Action. Action Network. <laughs> right. uh, and we have Jackson from Uganda who works uh, with Oxfam. These are three seasoned activists who have been working on environmental justice issues for, for many years now. And the idea today is not so much to talk about environmental justice, but to talk about how we address our climate emergency now, today, very quickly, and at the same time, work on climate equity, address the communities that are most affected. There are three strategies that are emerging from the methane pledge that are very different. They're very different sectors, but they have to do with climate equity. The first is oil and gas. We know that in the oil and gas sector, there are many ways to reduce emissions. Uh, we have to change out technologies. The companies know how to do this. They're not necessarily doing it, but they do know how to do it. And the solutions are not only good for climate change, they're good for business. Yeah. They're low to no cost changes in technology that would help reduce emissions, but would also help communities that live near oil and gas sectors. And we're going to hear more about that from John in a moment. We also have agriculture as one of the main focus areas. In farming uh, operations, we have emissions. We have emissions from cows, from dairy cows, from agricultural waste. And these emissions can mix with other gases and cause terrible air quality uh, circumstances for communities that are living on farms, for workers, and for, for other communities that li live near farms. In our legal systems, we are challenged. We're challenged on what to do about contamination when we find it. And we are finding more and more of it. More and more methane emissions are being revealed by the newest technologies of satellites. And groups like uh, Gustavo's SEMDA in Mexico are challenging the authorities. We're, we're looking at ways for our governments and for our businesses to change the game, to take action, to reduce emissions. So I would like this conversation to share the experiences from each of the regions, talk about your challenges, and maybe we can start with Texas. Okay. Where oil and gas, a big problem that we have all around the world, it's not just in Texas, but Texas really is the heart of the American oil industry. And we have a lot of experience with contamination and problems with fence line communities. Tell us, John, what you're doing today and how you see the methane pledge and how it will play out for you in the next few years. How do we get to reduce oil emissions quickly to help communities and to help climate? Well, you said it right. It takes, in, in Texas, oil is king. You know, people think that you wake up every morning with an oil well in your backyard and, and seeing all of that. But yes, uh, oil is king, most definitely. You have the Permian Basin, which is a large repository of oil and gas in Texas. And that is exported down to where I live on the Gulf Coast to numerous cities like Freeport, Corpus Christi, Galveston, Houston, and others. And in the course of doing that, 
these companies in processing for export or for domestic use are emitting just what you said, a lot of methane into the atmosphere, not just from the Permian where it basically even just seeps out of the ground from uncapped wells and unregulated wells, but also in the processes that go on in refineries, which by the way, I'm a 38 year employee of, former employee of Exxon Mobil Corporation, so please don't hold that against me. But <laughs> That's the sort of thing that you're, goes You're not on repenting for, for your... Uh... Yeah, I'm now, I'm now doing penance for you know, that, <laughs> okay, that well, 38 okay. years sin. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that those processes to make oil and gas, to give America and the world the opportunities it has to drive cars and fly planes and all of that, in the course of doing it, communities like Port Arthur and others along the Gulf Coast are sacrificed. We're sacrificed zones because of all the pollution that comes from these facilities air, water, and ground. And methane is one of the biggest. So it's very important to us that that methane pledge be taken seriously, and also that companies start doing things to regulate the amount of gas they release, which a large portion of it is, just, like I said, unregulated because it's just not something they're being required to do. Right. State agencies like TCEQ and the, that's the regulatory that's agency regulatory in agency, Texas have limited powers because the legislature, which empowers them, simply got their hands tied and won't give or put in place any other legislation that is going to allow for greater scrutiny and tightening down right. on this. I, I'd like to stop there for a moment because okay. you brought up an issue that I think Gustavo can tell us a lot about, which is the regulatory agency. One of the things that some of these groups that you see on the wall have been working on is to get countries like Mexico and even states in the United States that haven't done it yet to pass legislation to regulate the oil and gas sector. Well, in Mexico, we got that legislation a few years ago, and yet the government is not following up. They're not implementing uh, the regulations to reduce methane. And Gustavo's organization, which is an environmental law NGO in Mexico, very, very uh, versed and, and really knows their work and has a, a lot of cases in history and, and litigating on oil and gas, is trying to get those regulations uh, put in place and actually complied with. Gustavo, tell us about the challenges that you face as SEMDA and as an environmental activist to, to really move from the regulations to the implementation of the regulations. Yes, thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be with, with you and with my friends from uh, Texas and Uganda. Um, I would say that uh, <coughs> what we've been, we've been looking for is to make sure that any law, any regulation that we have, it's been properly and fully implemented. Um, in the case that you are uh, referring, um, which is a case of Mexico, we uh, indeed, the Mexican government uh, drafted and, and, um, and published the regulations for the methane uh, to be uh, regulated and with the time to, to get rid and avoid these emissions. Nonetheless, we have uh, the, the oil comp... The so let, let's stop for a moment while they tell us to wear our masks. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the COVID measures here at COP. Uh, every day we're doing COVID tests, so we've been trying to keep safe and healthy and we're being warned that we should put on our masks, but we're, we've taken them off momentarily for our panel. <laughs> Sorry, Gustavo, please continue. No, so I was saying that uh, the Mexican government did uh, draft it uh, and publish the regulations in order to assure that the methane emissions were going to be controlled and with the time reduced. No? Unfortunately, uh, as I was saying, the oil company, which is uh, Pemex, Petróleos Mexicanos, uh, re requested an extension for these reg regulations not to be enforced. And with this, um, they could continue you know, polluting, emitting this uh, emission, and no control was going to happen. Yeah. So the, they decided to uh, grant it the extension. So they gave a three-year extension. So we will need to wait until next year to see if this is going to happen. But uh, it is my belief that when we come to that time, they will ask for a new yeah, extension. 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 So, so because of this, um, we have uh, challenged this decision, legally speaking, 
So we brought a legal action against this uh, permit to extend the three-year implementation of the regulations. The case is uh, pending, the case is uh, going uh, before the judicial power, so we hope that the issues related to health and quality of life are uh, strong enough, are sufficient, in order to assure that the judges really take action in this respect and assure that the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources and, and let's say the federal government as a whole really starts working, implementing these uh, regulations. Great. Well, I'm going to come back in a moment to how we get around these delays, not only in the courts, but also by companies to implement and how individuals and nonprofit organizations can push more uh, in these next few years. But I want to turn to Uganda for a moment and talk about another dimension that we're seeing with the methane pledge. So it, it seems like we would all want to reduce methane emissions, unless maybe you're an oil company and it, there's no profit incentive for you. But we're hearing from farmers that they think the methane pledge is against them. That somehow reducing methane is an attempt to take away hamburgers from consumers. That we're hearing that in the United States, we're hearing it in Europe. Uh, we were just with the negotiators here at COP uh, of the countries of Paraguay and other countries like Argentina and Uruguay. The agricultural sector is resisting the methane pledge. It's our belief that it shouldn't be that way, that there are ways to reconcile climate policy and emission reductions with farmer productivity. Can you tell us what's happening in Uganda and how you're addressing climate change in the agricultural sector and what is the role of farmers who depend on their productivity uh, in relation to these new climate policies that are aiming to reduce emissions. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Uganda, where I come from, is an agrarian country. Um, the economy basically depends on agriculture. About 70% of the population depend on agriculture, and agriculture which is rain-fed, but also small-scale dominated. And uh, as I speak, uh, the climate challenge is a very big emergency that the farmers are grappling with. The farmers are grappling with seasonal variations. They are grappling with losses because of seasonal variations. Droughts, uh, where we don't have droughts, we are seeing a lot of floods, mud, and landslides that are affecting the, the cropping systems. And so the farmers are really facing a challenge. They are grappling with uh, uh, the climate change challenge. Um, uh, Uganda as a country has uh, designed a lot of uh, programs and policies on agriculture, for instance, the National Adaptation Plan for Agriculture, that talks about how agriculture can be used as a, a, as a, a farming system that will support uh, agriculture mitigation and adaptation as well. But, but like you say, uh, the challenge has always been on, on the implementation of what is enshrined in the adaptation plans. We recently passed the climate change policy. We have submitted our NDCs and now NDCs we are promising that we will do a lot of adaptation and mitigation within the agriculture sector. But how that is going to put into play is still a question that we need to, to, to ask ourselves. Oxfam as an, an organization is happy with the pledge, the global pledge on methane reduction, and we think it's the way to go. We are happy to know that African countries are here and they will ratify the pledge and they will implement the pledge to reduce methane within the agriculture sector. So now what we need to do as, a, as a countries is to go back and build the capacity of the agriculture uh, farmers, the farmers in, in Uganda, the farmers in Sudan. The other day uh, during the KJWA, Sudan was saying we don't want to talk about livestock under KJWA because if you talk about livestock, you're talking about the livelihoods of the people. And so we need to enhance the capacity of the people, of the farmers in livestock, the capacity of the farmers in crop to understand that actually they are contributing much to methane production and that they can play a role in terms of methane reduction. Once we build the capacity of, of the farmers, we will achieve a lot. But also to say is that there are countries that are already doing a lot uh, out, out there, especially the, the, developing, the developed countries. Yesterday I listened to the US, I listened to the European Union, a lot is happening out there in terms of technologies that support uh, methane reduction in agriculture. And so I would also look at an opportunity where there is technology transfer to the African countries that look at agriculture as the backbone, uh, the agriculture and livestock 
as the way of life. And so technologies that can support these agricultural farmers, these livestock farmers, to participate in methane reduction. I think that, that would be the best way to go. Thank you. Thank you for those reflections on agriculture. So methane, the oil and gas sector has told us, they, first of all, they call it natural gas. And there was a recent study in the United States, and it was just a poll. And they asked people, what do you think of natural gas? And the response was, it's clean. Yeah. <laughs> then they asked, what do you think of methane? Oh, no, that's dirty. Well, it's the same, <laughs> same thing, right? Thing. You know? yeah. And so th there's a <laughs> yeah. challenge there. Yeah. Yes, there is. The, the other challenge is the fact that methane is invisible. Yeah. When you walk by the oil and gas site and you see those tanks holding petroleum, you don't see the methane. Yeah. And when you walk by, it looks like a beautiful day, everything's clean, and yet if you were to take a FLIR camera, which is an infrared camera that actually looks at those emissions, right. and we've done this in Mexico, we've done it in the United States, we've done it in Argentina and Colombia, I call it the wowometer. The moment someone looks through that lens, and sees those emissions, they go, wow. Yeah. And I've shown those videos to oil and gas executives. And at first, they didn't even believe it was from their facilities. Yeah. So the invisibility of methane is a problem. And here we're talking about a, a pledge to reduce methane. Yeah. How do we tell the farmers? How do we tell the people living in fence lines communities? Yeah. How do we get the government officials that we're litigating against to understand there is a problem. Yeah. Methane is 84 times worse than CO2 yeah. as a climate pollutant. Yeah. And the scientists are saying, if we don't reduce methane, we don't get to the 1.5 limits on global warming. Yeah. So maybe if you guys can talk a little bit about the, the world that you live in and where you are activists and how the invisibility problem of methane and the awareness can really be overcome so that people do start to act on methane. Let's start with Mexico. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, probably one of the first questions that we have to, to do to ourselves is why we only talk about CO2, no? Uh, when we heard about the IPCC very recently, three months ago, they say, hey, hey, it, it's not only CO2. Take a look at methane, no? So I think that we need to take that into account and we need to to take that information and translate it in a very basic, basic way yeah. to everybody, no? Because people have no idea what are you talking about when you say methane, no? It has happened to me, in my family, my friends. They ask me, what are you talking about when you refer to methane, no? So I think that this needs a huge visibility campaign yeah. uh, at the ground level in order for people to understand about this, no? If executives at the oil companies do not believe, <laughs> imagine everybody out there, no? Right. So I think that uh, we need to do something in that respect. Second, I believe that we need to do a lot of, uh, uh, of capacity building and training to the communities where the oil and gas facilities are. Because they have no idea what is happening around them, no? They are having very uh, bad times because uh, they have impacts on their health, no? They have impacts on their life, in their quality of life. And they have no idea that this is because of methane, no? So how can we assure that these people are empowered no? at the local level and then be there, all those people, be the ones who start demanding, who start taking legal action, no? Who go and talk to the officials, go and talk to the media. So start doing all that pressure. But if they don't know what they are breathing, no, it will be very hard for them to really get to be conscious about which way they have to go. No? So I believe that um, at the international level, we need all sectors of society uh, understanding this and then go to the action. Let's go to Port Arthur. You've, you've done this. You've mobilized people. You're the cowboy out there fighting the oil and gas sector to make this a visible problem. How do you do it? Where should we go? And how do we get people to think about methane and the impacts that they're suffering because of methane? Well, first, you've got to follow the science, in my opinion, because you use the science to talk to the chemical companies that are actually doing the actual polluting. Yeah. But then you also take that same science and you translate it into something people can understand. Because yes, we all see the flaring. Yeah. You know, from the Permian to the Gulf, we see the flaring. We see the units, the upsets. We smell the odors. 
you know, even though the gas is odorless, uh, matter of fact, there was an incident several years ago where one of the gas companies had a problem with the, what they call stinkum. They, they put in this fracked gas to make it where you could smell it. And it was so bad that basically they had to shut the entire city's gas system down and purge it until it happened. And it made a lot of people sick. But the key thing is, is to make it real by telling them, number one, that which you see is part of the problem, the gas and the flaring, and that which you don't see is part of the problem. And you use that gas in your home every day. And then we have to relate what the health effects are. Because so many people, because of the overall pollution, have respiratory problems, have heart, lung, and kidney disease, and that's part of the problem. So we take what's actually there, what they can see of this invisible gas, and educate them and use the science to not only get a change or shift in the way this is done and the business is handled, to say now is the time for us to reduce our dependence, then we use that science once again to educate, coach people up, and make the changes we need by mobilizing people, because people are our greatest resource. The people are going to make the changes. They're going to motivate and push the changes on the corporate level as well as the government level. It sounds like there's a lot of communication work that still needs yeah. to be done. I'm hearing the same thing. Yeah. Africa, what can you tell us about the challenges of communicating and getting people to understand the impacts of methane? Uh, Daniel, I think for Africa, I think the challenge is even more bigger, much bigger, much bigger, because uh, what is happening in Africa there is um, uh, this, this oil exploration development that has come up and leaders in Africa do not want you to talk about oil exploration vis-a-vis -vis carbon emissions and methane production because they think that's the, the livelihood, that's where they will uh, emerge in terms of uh, economic development uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the countries that are engaging in livestock. They don't want you to talk about livestock management because they think you're already encroaching on what uh, is supporting to build their, their livelihood. So it's, it's a huge problem. And, and so what do we need to do? I think what we need to do as, um, as countries, now that the pledge has been uh, pronounced at COP26, how do we localize that to reach the countries where we, we are coming from? Africa, what is it that we are taking back home in terms of localizing the pledge that has been announced at COP26? How do we make ratifications in the can in country and then implement those ratifications that will help us curb the, the methane? But also, like Gustavo said, empowering the local communities, those that are affected by climate change impacts, to understand that methane is a contributor to the climate change impacts that are affecting their production capacities, that are affecting their livelihood options, and so they have to do something. How do they hold accountable mm -hmm. the leaders to make sure that policies that have been ratified, that have been ascended to, are implemented, financed, so that there is action done at grassroots level. That must be done, and it must be done today. Daniel, I think that's... Me, okay, me, okay go, let, go for it. I want to hear you guys. Let me talk very quick, because uh, it was said here that we need to reduce dependence, no? right. which I'm fully uh, in agreement. No? How, how is that going to happen in countries like Mexico, for example, when the government today is building refineries, no? mm. when the government is uh, promoting uh, coal, the use of coal power plants yes. no? from the Federal Electricity Commission, no? when you have a constitutional amendment before the Congress today yeah. that gives priority to the... Um, Combustolio, how do you say it? Yeah, diesel fuels yeah. and... Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, generally. I mean, it gives priority to fossil fuels and leaves renewables at the last. So when you have those actions and those initiatives from the government, no, where is the political will yeah. that you will need in order for this to really bring down the dependence that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. No? And how are we going to comply with the pledge no? in the year 2030 if we are going completely the other way? No? So, so I think we need our governments to come out, to go back home after mm. being here and, and let us know which is the agenda, which is the route, which is the strategy that they're going to use and implement in order to get 
to the year 2030 and bring the emissions down. Today, at least in the case of Mexico, this is not happening and it may not happen. Why? Because as I said before, the policy is going completely the other way. Yeah. Yeah. The, b before I turn it over to you, uh, John, I was hearing just yesterday, and we were discussing this earlier, how Mexico just announced in the meeting of the CCAC no fracking permits. However, they're, you told me they're budgeting for fracking, <laughs> right? Yes. Argentina, country that I know very well, yeah. uh, is betting on fracking yeah. for their energy needs to the future. Yeah. So as you say, we're saying one thing and then doing another. Yeah. Governor of California re recently banned new fracking permits. You know, that's a tough decision to make. Yeah. The same as banning natural gas installations in homes. Yeah. But if, we're, if we don't start doing that, yeah. this is hypocrisy. We don't get to 2030. Yeah. Let's hear from, from John in Texas. It's fundamentally inconsistent for government elected officials to say that we are going to reduce while at the same time building up the petrochemical industry, building up more pipelines and more facilities. That's just fundamentally inconsistent to do that. Full well, as I like to no? say, you can't subtract by addition. Yeah. You've got to actually subtract. You've got to actually take it offline. Yeah. What needs to happen immediately, in my opinion, is to freeze everything at current levels and then start working your way back from it. You can't continue, as you just said, to expand and do more when you say, you want to reduce the impact of methane and petrochemical and fossil fuels on the environment. That's just inconsistent. So what has to happen, and you got to remember, what's, what's ruling that in the governments is big money from big <laughs> oil. They're lobbying and doing that. But what we have an advantage of, we have the power of people. The farmers in Uganda, yeah. the regular everyday citizen yeah. in Port Arthur that lives in the, on the fence line and all across the Gulf Coast and all of Texas, and the people that interact with government, our elected officials. Yeah. One of the things myself and one of my colleagues talked about is when we go back home, we're going to have to knock on some doors and get them to actually come and see. So Daniel, I tell folk when we talk about it and I show them pictures, don't take my word for it. Come and see what it actually does, what it looks like at ground zero. And we'll explain the science to you. Mm -hmm. And then let's see what you, then we want to know, what are you going to do? Because we're going to demand you take some action. We have to go in the other direction, just as you say. We can't build up and out. We've got to reduce it down. Yeah. It sounds like one of our big responsibilities is to vote wisely and, and, and think about who our leaders are. And, you know, we, Donald Trump is a punching bag for the United States, but he's not the only one who's pro oil and gas. Right, no. And there are a lot of Democrats that are as well. And so we need to. We need to grab this, uh, this bull by the horns and bring him down. I think you guys need to, you know That's how right. to do that in Texas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let, let's start closing our ideas here. Yeah. You know, we are at COP26. Yeah. Our leaders are here negotiating yeah. climate change policy. They've made a methane pledge. A lot have, not, not all countries have. Yeah. Uh, what's next? What, how do we go back now, as, as you just suggested? We go back now to our countries, to our organizations, to NGOs, that are advocating for cleaner climate policy. Methane is the big challenge. It's a low-hanging fruit. If we do methane intensely and aggressively for the next few years, we're going to make a difference, yeah, we, hope. Right. We, we hope. We yeah. hope. Uh, what's our next step? W what's important for the leaders and what's important for advocacy communities like yours to do to make sure that by 2030 we're not lamenting that we didn't make it to our targets. Let's start with, I with think, Jackson. I think for, 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 for Uganda and for Africa, what, what I will encourage the civil society agencies that are participating at COP to make sure that we go back and mobilize. Mobilize, mobilize. Mobilize communities, mobilize farmers, mobilize business uh, entities that are involved in production to make sure that we raise the awareness on the global goal that has been announced. Once everybody is aware, then they will use that as a mandate to hold the leaders accountable on what they have assigned to. And again, next is, uh, of course, capacity building. Capacity building yeah, we've that I've that. talked about that as one. A panel. And, and again, um, um, uh, influencing governments to come up with long-term sustainable strategies of how the goal should be implemented at country level, at continental level. Those strategies should be, should be designed but the design of the strategy should be participatory, involving the local people, the farmers that are affected, to be part of their teams 
that participate in the planning processes of long-term strategies for methane reduction, and then mobilizing finances for technology, technology transfer, and encouraging cross-learning at, at different levels. Because I know success stories are emerging in, 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 uh, in Texas, for instance. They are emerging in the United States of America where they're doing a lot of farming, but trying to look at technologies that are supporting uh, methane reduction. So how do we encourage cross-running across border, across the countries, across continents, to make sure that they learn and we learn and put methane reduction at scale? Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Mexico. Gustavo, what, what are you taking away from COP? What are you hearing? What are you seeing as the next step that we fundamentally have to take? I think that um, we need to make public officials accountable for what they do not do. So as we say before, uh, in Mexico there has been an omission in order to put the regulation in place. So if public officials are not willing to do the, their job properly, you have to bring them to justice, no? I, sorry, but it has to be the case, no? So I, I believe that uh, one of the messages that I would like to deliver today is that uh, let's not be afraid of using the law. Yeah. Let's not be afraid of challenging, legally speaking, uh, things that are not uh, done properly. Because I believe that sometimes people are more based on science, which is okay, yeah. are more based on technical data, which is okay. But all, you also need the law, no? which can give you, it's a very powerful tool in order to assure uh, in a legal way that things can move in the right direction with, let's say, the support of the judicial power. So even if you are not an expert in environmental law or you're not an expert in oil and gas law, etc., I think you need to approach those uh, NGOs, those pro bono lawyers who are willing to support the groups, the individuals, the communities, the farmers, the peasants, no? in order to make sure that the case, they do have a case and have a very strong case. Another avenue that I, I, I see here is that we can support whatever we do uh, in international agreements. No? So it's not only the national regulations, but also there's some things that we can, like the pledge. No? Right. The, the pledge, it's a very powerful tool that we, we can use at the national level and say, look at this, our country came to Glasgow, they signed, how are they going to put it into practice? No? So uh, another example is the, in the Americas, we have a new agreement, which is the Escazú Agreement, no? which is based on, on principle 10 of the Rio Declaration. Yeah. Access to environmental information, yeah. access to environmental justice, and the possibility of uh, the people to participate in the decision-making process. But also, by the way, <laughs> very important, it refers to the importance of environmental defenders <coughs> to have a safe and secure place in order to do their job properly. Right. So these kind of instruments at the international level can support very much our cases. And let's also get to know them, use them, and put them into practice. Right. So before we turn over to John, I want to build off of one point that you just made. Uh, all of them were great, but the one about access to information. So I don't know if you've seen the pictures around the methane pavilion, but we've got some satellites that are coming online. Yep. Some are already online, some are about to come online, and it's going to show us where the methane is. What we know today is that we don't know. Right, so the oil and gas tells us they emit X amount of methane, but that's a theoretical assumption. Yeah. What they've done is they've looked in the laboratory what each piece of their equipment emits, yeah. and they multiply it by the number of pieces of equipment they have, yeah. and then they tell us they contaminate X amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in Mexico, we recently discovered with the help of EDF yeah. and their satellite information that Mexico's actually emitting more than twice what they said they were emitting. Yeah. We're hearing from the Russians they're not emitting, <laughs> which is a, a bit comical. Yeah. They're right here in front of us. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we hear from the oil and gas sector in the United States that they're complying. And yet we know they're not. We've yeah. taken the cameras. Mm -hmm. So when we get those satellites in orbit and it's showing us, we've got to use that information. And that's a big challenge. Yeah. So how are we going to get groups like yours and yours and yours to properly get this information and then, as you say, hold accountable 
the public officials that should be controlling those companies. I think that's one of our biggest challenges going forward, is to use information that we're getting on methane to hold uh, policy people and companies accountable. So let's hear from, from John. Uh, I think just, you have a, you have a last... Just one thing, very, okay. very quick. What happens in those countries where you don't have an independent investigation or an, uh, an independent research as you did? Yes. Where you find out that there was twice. Right. So the governments lie to us. No, they are not giving us the proper information. No. Imagine I don't have a chance to hire somebody to to look at the emissions. Look, no. Yep. So I will go. Okay, twenty percent. Ah, okay. No. So we need to make sure also make them accountable on the way that they report, the w the way that they monitor. No. And if they don't do it right, again, let's legally bring an action in order to assure that they are going to do their job as they Sit. have to do it. Right. So John, you, you told me, and I said earlier to you that, I said you're a cowboy from Texas, and you said I'm all hat and no horse, <laughs> right? But I, did you find your horse here? Are, well, are you yeah. going back and, well, and do you have a marching order? You know, it's good you say that because, yeah, I have found my marching orders. I have found a mechanism <laughs> that we can use. And you know, I think the key thing we all were talking about was accountability. And to tell you the truth, the solution to this is real easy. Joe Biden and the administration currently have given us the roadmap for it. They did it all themselves. So now we use that accountability factor you talked about. Joe Biden said, we're going to build back better. I belong to a coalition of organizations, you know, across the country, and we say to build back better, you got to build back fossil free. Yeah. So in building back fossil free, we have several points that we're saying. One is to declare a climate emergency, because without declaring the climate emergency, Biden can't use that climate emergency and the national statutes that are already on the books, as you said, to be able to stop this petrochemical build out and roll things back to stop where we are and then also implement clean, green strategies that will help us reduce methane, that will help us reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So he's given us the roadmap, but the devil's in the details. And that's when we have to hold them accountable, we have to educate our communities mm. and get them involved and engaged in the process, and then we actually have to sit down and do the hard work. So the devil's in the detail, but the roadmap's already there. Well, so this cowboy now not only has a horse, <laughs> he's also got a path to follow. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. I did thank the, the crowd that came here to, to watch this panel. I've learned a, a, a lot about your regions and your work. I think we all have a very clear message about where we need to go. Uh, the, the, the earth has no more time. I mean, we, we need to fix this problem. Uh, we know how to fix it. I, I hope it's not too late. The scientists tell us that we do have a window of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, a big piece of that will be methane, and that's why we've, we've done this methane pavilion here with the help of the groups that you see here on the wall, mm. uh, with the help of the negotiators who have understood that this is important. 108 countries now have signed the methane pledge. Yeah. We don't get to 1.5 degrees without methane, yeah. and it's low-hanging fruit. Yeah. We know how to do this, and we can do it in an equitable way. Yeah. We can do it in a way that helps communities, uh, it's cost effective, it's zero cost in many ways, and it could actually help productivity. Yeah. Uh, this is something we should all be working towards. So thank you very much. I Daniel, hope to... before you conclude, yeah. Yeah, I sure. just wanted to say something very small. Okay. You talked about information, and I think that will call for investment in research, research and studies. Yeah. And then when it comes to the different sectors, we need multi-stakeholder approaches to, towards uh, uh, methane reduction. And lastly to say, agroecology at scale. Agroecology at scale will help us to do both adaptation and mitigation co-benefits for both methane and carbon. That's the way to go. Uh, in Africa, we are trying to say we move away from climate smart agriculture because that has been invaded by the Monsantos of this world, the big producers of fertilizers. Can we go agroecology, agroecology? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And signing off from COP26, I thank the panelists.